Hi, folks. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Terrence. Uh, my name is Jason Williamson. I am the Executive Director of the Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law here at NYU Law School. Um, we are grateful to all of you for joining us, um, and especially grateful to our colleagues from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who I will uh, let introduce themselves, um, but for them uh, taking the time to, to do this uh, FOIA training for us. I'm so glad there's so much interest. Um, I will pass it back to, to Terrence to get us started, um, but just want to thank everyone for, for being here and also thank Terrence for his efforts in helping to put this together. Terrence? Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. Um, as Jason said, my name is Terrence Pitts. I'm a staff member. I'm at the Center on Race and Equality in the Law at NYU School of Law. Um, thank you again for joining us. I want to, again, thank our colleagues at EFF um, Beryl and Dave, um, thank you so much for our fantastic trainers, for collaborating with us. We really appreciate it. Before we jump in, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, as you can see, we're recording today's session. We're going to make it available for others on the center's website. Um, so look out for that in case you want to share it with others. Should be there in a couple of days. We're reserving about 20 minutes at the end of, towards the end of the training for your questions. However, feel free to put your questions in the chat function um, in the webinar. You um, Probably the chat function may be a little bit more interactive than the Q&A function, um, but you can try both uh, with a preference for the chat function. We'll monitor the chat room and collect your questions during the training, um, and then we'll consolidate like questions. Um, and then I will read those out to Barrow um, and to Dave. Um, when it's time for the Q&A session. So with that said, I'm going to pass the baton to our fantastic trainers, let them introduce themselves, and we'll get started. Thank you. Dave, you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi. I'm Dave Voss. I am Director of Investigations at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, and uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And uh, But Beryl's going to be leading this session, so I'll let her do the deeper introduction. Hey, and I am Beryl Lipton. I am an investigative researcher with EFF. I work very closely with Dave on a lot of things, police surveillance, and uh, feel very fortunate to be talking to all of you and to be able to work with Dave and nerd out on FOIA all of the time um, because Dave and I both really love FOIA, love talking to people about FOIA, and um, hope that you are going to learn a lot during this session. Um, so as mentioned, we are coming at you from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The EFF has been around for about 30 years, and we focus on all sorts of things related to the preservation of civil rights and um, other freedoms that we have um, as they interact with the digital world and the expansion of society's use of technology. So this includes a lot of different things um, related to privacy, to free expression, to the different types of innovation that can happen in the tech space, um, but also can impede our ability to leave, uh, lead free, fulfilling lives. Um, so that is what EFF does. And Dave and I look a lot at different types of street level surveillance. So these are all sorts of technologies that police might use or that you might find um, just during your everyday life or you know might even um, encounter just through use of the technologies that you have in your pocket, in your homes. Um, and that work um, is done as part of our threat lab. The threat lab is where we sort of do uh, deep dive investigations into surveillance technologies. And a lot of that work um, uh, is through the use of public records. Uh, so we uh, do a lot with a lot with records. Um, as I mentioned, Dave and I love FOIA. Here is a cool image of Dave that was drawn in the nib of Dave making uh, snow angels in his records. Um, it, FOIA, is, is kind of like a superpower for the people and it's very exciting to be able to introduce people to FOIA because uh, it is, you know, one of those, those sort of powers uh, that the people have when interacting with authority that historically hasn't existed for, for humans. And so it's very cool that um, 
we live in a time where that, that is a possibility for us, even though it is often dysfunctional. So, um, you know, we care a lot about transparency generally. So transparency is basically this idea that the public has a right to know what the government is up to. Um, and there are lots of important benefits, um, as I think most of you can imagine, uh, to having a transparent government, right? It allows the electorate to be better informed. It allows um, people to keep an eye on where there's waste or fraud and potentially even prevent corruption and other overreach uh, by the government actors. It allows us access to the different types of actions that the government is taking um, that we might not otherwise know about. Plus, there are lots of very um, interesting and useful data points that the government collects through its normal business that can be helpful to other sectors. And the private sector is very aware of this, but there are also um, really important pieces of information that could be used by those investigating climate, by those looking just at society in general. And so there are lots of places where the taxpayer funded research that is conducted by the government can be useful in other areas. So there's lots of really a lot of good reasons why transparency is important to us. And specifically, we're talking about here, uh, freedom of information, which is this democratic concept that the government belongs to the people, is for the people, by the people, and thus the people should be able to access a lot of the records and policy uh, papers and other materials that are going into that decision-making process, right? So here is a little snippet from uh, Lyndon B. Johnson when he was signing the FOIA, in which he, notes, right, that the purpose of the FOIA comes from one of our most essential principles. A, a democracy works best when the people have all of the information that the security of the nation will permit. And you'll note that in that sentence, while sort of pointing to the importance of the people's access to information, also notes uh, the concerns around national security. And so after the FOIA was signed into law on July 4th, 1966, as part of that process, and ever since then, there have been these concerns around what is too much information for the government, for people to be able to access. And a lot of those questions center around these ideas of national security, around law enforcement, and around business interests. And this has sort of been a long thread uh, through FOIA's existence. Since the federal FOIA came into being, um, all of the states have enacted their own public records laws. And a lot of uh, countries throughout the world have also adopted their own freedom of information laws. So um, when we're talking about public records, we're generally talking about almost everything that the government has in its possession. Uh, there are a lot of gray areas and we'll talk about those. But in general, the idea is that if it is a, a government record, if it was a record that was created or came into the possession of a public agency, that is a public record. And this can include all sorts of the sort of traditional ideas of documents that we might have, which can include letters and reports and presentations and all of those. But it also includes a lot of electronic records. Uh, it includes video, audio, databases. Um, so, you know, if, if it's something that the government created, that's possibly a public record and, and probably is. Um, but that does not necessarily mean that it will be made public. Um, not a public record. Um, if a government employee has to create that new record, even if it's a record that you think that the government should already have. So, for example, uh, spreadsheets of certain aggregated information or, you know, reports assessing the uh, effectiveness of a certain program, even if you think that these records should exist, even if there are records that a government report says do exist, uh, if they don't exist, you can't get that record, it just doesn't exist. Um, and also documents that are held by private individuals generally aren't public records. Um, there are some exceptions, but that's basically how that breaks down. Um, and so this public records request that, that we're talking about, right, that's just this act of asking the government for these, for these documents. Um, we, you know, one of the great things about public records requests is that they are 
legal requests, right? This is a legal obligation that government actors have to us as, as individuals. And so even as a reporter uh, and government agents might not respond to a question that we have or a sort of interrogation that we might um, bring to them, uh, but a public records request, they can't just ignore. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the records will often tell a different story than uh, what a, an official might provide uh, on his or her own. So there are two major types of public records laws that we're going to be thinking about. This presentation is primarily focused on the Federal Freedom of Information Act, but there are lots of similarities with public records on the state level. And um, the federal FOIA pertains to records created by federal agencies. And then as you can imagine, the state public records laws um, are relevant to state agencies and local agencies. And so you wouldn't necessarily make a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request to, for example, the New York Attorney General, you would make a Freedom of Information Law request. But as we're speaking sort of casually, we generally will use FOIA to refer to all sorts of public records requests. And in general, that is totally okay until you sort of get right down to the moment of actually writing out the law, in which case you want to refer to the proper law. So to begin with, you want to, to um, try to save yourself as much time as possible because this process can take a bit of time by determining whether or not there are already records that are responsive to your needs that exist online or in another place that is going to be easily accessible to you. So in general, if there is something um, that you might be interested in, always start with a basic Google search or you know whatever your um, web search engine of choice is. Uh, and also check out uh, the existing materials that might already be online, because sometimes that's going to save you a lot of multiple steps in the process. And sometimes your public records investigation is going to require a few requests. And so if you can cut out a couple of weeks, a couple of months waiting for records that are already accessible, you're obviously saving yourself um, a ton of time. I have a sheet for all of you um, with some of these resources, um, but just note, right, that there are on the state level and on the federal level already a lot of different archival guidelines that sort of uh, dictate what agencies are supposed to keep, how they're supposed to keep them, and for how long they're supposed to keep them. And that can be a really good way of understanding what is already being held in a government agency's filing cabinets, and also how they are already talking about it. And if you can sort of frame your request in such a way that you are using the vocabulary that they are already used to using in their offices, you're going to make your life and their lives a lot easier. So it can be very helpful to just check out, right, the state archival rules, general record schedules, if there's a subject matter listing or some of these other indices that would indicate what might already be available or might already be required to be retained by this agency. Also, double check an agency's own, the agency's uh, website, do a site search of that website. Sometimes agencies post things that they don't realize that they've made public. Sometimes they post things and the records officer doesn't realize that it's already online. So you can save everybody a lot of time by checking that out. Also give a look to some previously released or otherwise public records. A site called Muckrock has a lot of um, not only the records that have been released to public records requests, but also the back and forth that occurred between the requester and the agency. So you can get a really good sense of sort of how an agency responds to a request and how long it takes them. And generally what kind of their attitude is towards dealing with requesters. The Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press has an open government guide that is super helpful, particularly when you're looking at different states and their public records laws. So I'd recommend checking that out. And then 
oops, I'm agency's own website on here twice. Um, in addition to the agency's own website, check out the FOIA reading room um, that a lot of different federal agencies have. This is going to be a collection of previously released public records. And so that can give you a sense of what's already out there. Um, and also check out FOIA logs if you're not really sure. A FOIA log is essentially the log of all of the requests that an agency has received. And so it will give you really good information about what kind of request it was, whether or not the agency released any materials and sort of how long it took them to get around to doing that. Um, you can also much more quickly get access to already uh, released, already processed records. Um, so if you see something on a FOIA log that you are interested in, you can always request those particular records by essentially just pointing to that FOIA request number um, or that sort of um, entry in their FOIA log. So in general, um, you know, we are constantly sort of looking for places that we can be FOIAing. Um, and, and we are, are asking these questions, um, how does it, how does this particular event, whatever it is that we're interested in, this issue intersect with government agencies? And then what bureaucratic, bureaucratic paper trail could that create, right? So um, some people suggest, you know, sort of thinking about this kind of like jeopardy, like, can you rephrase this in the form of a, doc, a document? Um, so you are not under FOIA entitled to the answer to a question. So one could not say, I want all of your records related to um, how much, you know, how much did you spend this year as an agency? I wouldn't necessarily be able, I wouldn't be entitled to the answer to that question, but I would be able to say, I would like to see all of your invoices for all purchases made this year, or I would like to see all budget reports for purchases made this year. And that is in the form of a document. And ideally that document is going to answer your question, but you can't really just straight out answer the question. They don't have to answer it. Um, I see that there's a question about Fees, I will get to fees um, and hopefully we can come back to this. Yes. Okay. So the very, very basics of crafting your Freedom of Information Act request. I want you to know going into this that there is a presumption of disclosure, right? So um, agencies are, the burden is on the agency to tell you why you're not entitled to particular records even though there are categories of records that they are allowed to withhold from disclosure, when they do that, they need to tell you um, why, why specifically, what exemption, what part of the law gives them the right to withhold that from you. And when they do that on the federal level, they're also supposed to be explaining what the foreseeable harm of that disclosure would be. So just know going into it that even though an agency is possibly one of those agencies that is notoriously difficult to work with, or even if you feel as though maybe your records aren't going to be the kinds of records that agencies are going to want to release, know that it's it's your right and that they are supposed to do that. Um, this, I'm going to skip over this because there are lots of different places that, that you can use FOIA, um, and, and we'll talk about some of them. And I hope that some of you will bring up what you are interested in and what brings you to this session in the first place. Okay, so some very, very basics. FOIA applies to government agencies, but generally only the executive branch. The federal FOIA applies to um, a bunch of different agencies that fall under the executive branch, but not the White House itself. It does not apply to the legislature. It does not apply to the courts. Federal agencies have about 20 business days uh, to get to you a response of some sort or a date, an estimated completion date for when they are going to be able to get you your records or to get you a rejection. And most of the states also have a fixed time in which agencies are required to respond. You can see in this map, which comes from Muckrock, that not every single state has a uh, a time frame in which agencies have to respond. But even in those states, the law generally says that agencies have to respond within a reasonable amount of time. That can be kind of vague, but if an agency, if you're asking an agency for their calendar entries for today and it takes them 
six months to get that to you, you would have a very strong case that they did not take a reasonable amount of time. They took an unreasonable amount of time. Um, so there are nine specific exemptions. We'll get to those in a second. There are also fees. So it is not free in all cases to request and receive public records. The requesting is generally free. You can do a lot of that online and, and you don't necessarily have to, to pay for that initial submission. But they agencies are allowed to charge requesters in a lot of cases for search time, for copy fees, and for whatever cost it is going to take to get you the records. So that is something to keep in mind um, and we can talk about more. Also, almost anybody can file a FOIA. Foreign governments do have some limit, limited access to the federal FOIA, but for the most part, you don't have to be a particular citizen of a place. You don't have to have a particular reason. Anybody can, can file a FOIA. Some of the states have specific residency requirements where one does actually have to live in a state to request records there. And Louisiana has an age requirement where one has to be 18. But for the most part, FOIA is for everyone. The federal FOIA applies to federal agencies. Um, this is going to be sort of those three letter agencies that easily come to mind, FTC, FCC, Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security. It's also going to cover the military branches and also some of these government owned enterprises that we might not think about um, as frequently like Amtrak or Freddie Mac. It's good to sort of keep in mind the world of agencies that exist out there because some of these agencies like the Federal Bureau of Investigation are going to get many more records requests than some of these other agencies. And if you're looking into something where the same records are possibly held by two agencies, one of which is getting only a couple of requests a year, it is going to be to your benefit to also ask that agency. You're probably gonna get those records much more quickly. Those people are not going to be overburdened by the FOIA process in general. So they're much more likely to be able to work with you, to be willing to get on the phone with you and actually talk to you about what it is that you want. And so keep in mind that there are so many more federal agencies than we generally are considering on a daily basis or we see in the news. Um, FOIA, again, does not apply to state and local agencies, to the court, to the legislature, um, to, the, to the president, and uh, a lot of the other presidential councils. Um, and I will just quickly note that even though that there, there are time frames in place, most agencies on the federal level are just blowing right by those time frames. This is sometimes to one's benefit because if they they totally blow by their um, their deadline, then they aren't allowed to charge you fees. So that's important to note. Um, but for the most part on the federal agency, federal level, agencies are not meeting that 20 day deadline. Um, and it is going to be much more, much quicker for people to be submitting requests to the state or to local agencies if possible. The FOIA exemptions. Okay, so there are nine different FOIA exemptions. Um, you are going to see, uh, particularly if you're interested in law enforcement agencies, a lot of B1 related to national security concerns um, and uh, B7, which is related to law enforcement records and po potentially ongoing investigations and also certain law enforcement techniques. There are also exemptions that keep, um, keep from disclosure personal information like social security numbers, sometimes addresses. There are exemptions like before, which is related to trade secrets and business information. Um, and then there are like kind of fuzzy exemptions like B2, which is related to internal personnel rules and practices, which can sometimes come up and block from disclosure certain parts of personnel files, or B5, which hides from disclosure um, inter and intra agency communications related to deliberative process. And so this is really fuzzy, right? Does this apply to all drafts before a final report? You know, we know it generally applies to certain 
um, attorney communications, but not all of them. And some eight, some people will refer to B5 as sort of the like withhold it because you want to exemption. And these are um, exemptions to keep in mind. You will encounter them. Be sure that they're citing ones that make sense. And then on the state level, I will just quickly note a lot of the exemptions look similar to these ones, but are not exactly the same. And so sometimes you're going to be able to get information from one state that you wouldn't be able to get from another state. Um, that can be that can be useful and good to know. You also will want to note that sometimes agencies will reference exemptions that are totally inapplicable. And you always want to double check and make sure that exemptions are being appropriately applied. Okay. So when are you submitting a FOIA request? Honestly, I mean, Dave and I submit FOIA requests for fun, you know, sometimes when we're just curious about what's going on. But, you know, definitely if you're working on a longer term investigation or research related to, you know, anything having to do with the government or the government might have been involved in, um, if you're working on some breaking news, if you have a, a longer term investigation, I, you know, uh, really love the stories of people, right, who are using FOIA as just residents in their municipality, and they're using it just to figure out when a certain street is going to be fixed or trying to figure out what, uh, you know, the police budget is going to be this year or things like that. So there are lots of times when you can submit a records request. It's also nice that you can submit it sort of at any time of day. They'll open it when they open their mail. And so um, if you think that someday the answer to a question that you might have is going to be helpful, uh, consider just filing that request. You'll be um, happy to see your answers um, someday in the future when you have long forgotten that you even had the question to begin with. When you're looking to file a records request, start by uh, determining what it is that you're actually asking. Like, what is your question? What is your goal? Are you interested in just getting information about when a contract ends because you want to know when you can better plan, how to better plan some sort of resistance action or community conversation around that particular procurement? Are you trying to sort of complicate a historical narrative and you have um, sort of existing research and you're trying to fill in some of the gaps or are you working to build a new story and you're not really sure if you have a story or if you are pretty sure you have a story but you're looking for some more details to try to flesh out uh, the reporting that you've been able to do you know so first firstly consider what it is that you're really trying to accomplish with this records request then go and see whether there's all there are already materials that are going to be helpful do your homework uh, you know you don't have to necessarily do an exhaustive search um, for for particular elements um, but whoops um, but see what specifics you can gather about your question that could possibly help you write a better records request or direct the public records officer. Terrence, I saw that your hand went up. Oh, we're fine now. The slide was stuck, but now it's fixed. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay, determine your requester status. Uh, we will talk about this in a second, but there are three different requesters, types of requester. You're going to want to figure out which one you are and then figure out uh, the best place to send your request. Uh, whoops. When trying to figure out what it is that you're requesting, again, you can't request the answer to a question. You can request a record, but you cannot ask for a record to be created. Um, so you want to try to the best of your ability to identify records that you want um, and the agencies that might have those records. Uh, FOIA requests have to be directed at a particular federal agency. You couldn't submit a request to just the general government and hope that somebody there figures out who has the answer to your question. That's not going to, that's not going to pan out for you. A FOIA request can be broad. It can search seek a large number of records, um, but you can't ask for, uh, use a FOIA request to request every single record an agency has. You wouldn't even want that. Um, but also agencies are entitled to reject your request for being unduly burdensome or voluminous. 
um, and not properly narrowed. Um, so I have seen people who have submitted requests to the FBI just asking for all of those files and those, those requests are gonna be rejected like that. There's no even um, trying to negotiate. Um, it's obviously going to be helpful to, to do that research, as I mentioned, um, and particularly if there's a record um, or a bit of information that is almost certainly on a record that was referenced in a speech or in an article or in another policy document. If you can sort of point to why you know that the government has this information and where they can find it, that's going to be really helpful for you and for them. So the world of records that you could request is pretty wide, right? This is like contracts and agreements. I would say those are pretty um, low level requests. You should be entitled to almost all contracts that the government enters into. Um, there are gonna be you know, receipts and invoices, and then there are gonna be sort of more specific information like special threat event assessments, that, which uh, for example, the FBI puts together uh, in advance of large events um, or databases or training materials or videos that you didn't know existed. Um, so there are all sorts of things out there um, that, that might be relevant. And it can help in your request if you are interested in sort of a general world of records, but you're not entirely sure what kind uh, to sometimes just like list out and point to the records that might be responsive to you. You almost all, you know, you always want to ask the agency most likely, the office most likely to have the records based on sort of your understanding of the situation. Um, and you will almost always be able to find the federal FOIA contact for an agency just on their website. You can just sort of do a web search uh, for a FOIA submission and whatever agency you're interested in. All requests should have some very similar elements. First and foremost, you probably, you're gonna to want to cite the law. Agencies can sometimes be um, nitpicky, right? Sometimes, you know, if you say, if you send an agency in Pennsylvania, a request that says under the Federal Freedom of Information Act, I would like these records, you are going to get kind of a passive aggressive letter back saying this is an informal request. Um, we are going to process it anyway. And this is because you didn't invoke the actual law that is applicable to this agency. And sometimes agencies are going to give you trouble about that. And sometimes agencies are going to um, not give you trouble until you get to the point where you actually have to take it to court, at which point your whole case could get thrown out because you didn't evoke the proper law. So just start from the beginning citing the proper law. Then um, also somewhere in your request, you want to state your requester status. On the state level, this is variably relevant because most states don't have different uh, requester statuses, but on the federal level, it is useful in determining fees. You want to include a clear description of what it is you'd like to receive. In general, you know, be as specific as you can be. If you really are only looking for one particular record, just ask for that one record. But sometimes you don't really know what kind of records you want, so you're going to try to frame your request to be as specific as possible without excluding records you didn't know existed. One of my very first records requests were um, was to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and I was looking for contracts related to a private prison that they held in Texas. And it was common knowledge that there was a private prison there and that it was run by ICE. Um, but ICE told me that they had no contracts for it. And upon further digging, I realized that what they actually had was an intergovernmental services agreement with the town in which the prison um, existed. So actually what ICE had was an IGSA with the town and then the town had a contract with the private prison company. So they were kind of technically, it was, a, it was an unfair reading of my request. Um, 
but also they read it as narrowly as they were entitled to and didn't give me any records. So now whenever I am asking for contracts, I generally include a lot of additional boilerplate language to the effect of, I also want any other agreements or similar materials that uh, might exist between this agency and this other entity, just to sort of cover my bases. You also want to, if relevant, include date parameters. This is particularly important if you are looking for emails because agencies are almost always going to want to know uh, sort of the time frame from, from what you want, the communications. Um, include all those other clues about that you know you sort of gathered during your research and include them so that agencies can sort of have a, um, a good idea of where to look. Um, ask for the records in the format in which you want them. So if you want them electronically, if they were created electronically and exist in an electronic format anyway, tell them that's how you want them. You don't want them, you know, printed out and then redacted and then scanned and then mailed to you. Uh, and then also let agencies know when you expect a response and how much you're willing to pay. So here's an example of a very simple records request, but say um, I am just interested in this police department's um, contract with a particular vendor. I'm saying uh, pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act or, or whatever the, the law might be, um, I request a copy of your contract, purchase orders, and all other agreements associated with your relationship with CreepyCore. Please provide all responsive materials in electronic format for the period from January 1st, 2015 through the date this request is processed. Um, and something as simple as that could uh, would, would suffice as a proper public records request. Public records request. Um, so, it's really, it can be a very straightforward process, right? You kind of determine what it is that you want. You write out a letter saying what it is that you, you want and why you feel entitled to get it. And also, um, you know, whatever other details you have about this particular record. Um, and, then, and then you wait, you send it off, find the right agency and, and wait for, for a response. Um, people are not sending out requests all of the time because agencies, because, Agencies don't always properly comply. Even though it is the law, the process can be a bit confusing. Sometimes people submit requests to the right place, but agencies never acknowledge them. Um, it's not clear what happens in those situations and people feel a little gaslit. Uh, the process can be very slow. People can become uh, uh, concerned that they are going to suffer some sort of retribution for asking for records, particularly in situations where local police are involved, um, if that's not legal, um, but it is a fear that people have. And, and it can just generally be, be a little frustrating um, if you haven't really had exposure to a sort of training like this um, or, you know, uh, are dealing with a particularly irritating agency. Um, and we see lots of, lots of examples of agencies behaving in poor faith. If you are curious about some of these examples, EFF has a project that we do every year called the Foilies, in which we highlight um, instances in which agencies responded poorly to public records requests. And if you guys have any of your own um, core experiences that might qualify for the Foilies, please do send them our way uh, because this year's Foilies are coming up. Um, some of the known barriers that we have talked, we've talked about, um, but, but again, just to sort of keep in mind, you know, sometimes your request is going to be framed in a way where it is genuinely burdensome, you weren't particularly clear, and the agency isn't going to know um, what it is that you're talking about. However, you know, sometimes the agency is just being a bit obstructive. Uh, they've been careless either with the records or with how they handle the FOIA uh, or public records process. They just genuinely don't know sometimes how to access certain records. So the person who is generally receiving your request is generally not the person who created the records, is not the person who filed the records. And so, um, you know, sort of things, issues like that 
um, come up. Um, and then, you know, uh, there are generally uh, poor records management practices and also good records management practices that get in the way, right? So agencies are supposed to keep records based on a retention schedule and they are entitled to destroy records at a certain point. And if they've destroyed records, you can't get those records. That's just how uh, existing is, I guess. Um, there are also going to be specific carve outs and, and types of proprietary information that you're not going to be able to access sometimes. Um, but some, but in a lot of cases, those exemptions are applied much more broadly than is appropriate. And so even though they are entitled to withhold certain pieces of information, again, just double check and make sure that every piece of information is properly exempted um, and that they've communicated the reasons why to you. Once you have submitted your records request, you know, one, just assume good faith. It, you're just going to get a lot further in the process trying to talk to the records officer as a human. Um, if you can get on the phone, the phone is definitely going to be your friend. Um, you know, you can get a lot done over email, but sometimes it's just slow. The person on the other end doesn't know what these records are, doesn't know what you're talking about, also is dealing with officers or colleagues who are not being particularly helpful in getting these materials. So just getting on the phone can be go a long way. Um, ask for your estimated completion date because you are entitled to that. When you get a response, interview the response, maybe as you would another source, you know, double check that they cited those valid exemptions. Did you include, did you get the materials that you expected to get? Um, and did you get records that you know exist, right? You know, I've seen situations in which people have provided a sort of example document to an agency as part of their request. And then the agency will basically find that same document in its files, redact it and send it back. Um, it doesn't make any sense, uh, but don't, don't act in good faith, but don't take at face value uh, what it is that you hear from the records office. Um, consider submitting a revised request, right? Sometimes your request could use some improvement, um, narrowly construed, the agency is technically um, complying with the law. And so maybe you want to reframe how you uh, requested your records. And then um, the federal FOIA agencies will give you the option to appeal. So use your appeal option. Some things to remember about the, the bureaucracy um, is that uh, your request is probably going to be passed around. Um, as I mentioned, the person who receives your request is probably not the person who was involved in creating or filing the request. So you do wanna try to give them a call and clarify when you can. You don't have to tell agencies why you're requesting. You might, um, you know, you might offer your requester feed category, and you might try to justify that. But if that is not a huge concern to you, you don't have to um, tell them why you're requesting. You don't even have to, on the federal level, um, provide your name, really. You, you can submit a request anonymously. And um, agencies will almost always release different materials in response to the same request. So you can work to craft a good request. You can cover most of your bases, but you're likely not going to craft like the perfect request. So um, I wouldn't waste days trying to do that. Um, remember that um, you kind of want your request to be built in such a way that if you it is rejected, you can combat the rejection. And this is also part of the policy of acting in good faith. If you can sort of document, you know, from the beginning, I asked this agency, you know, I told this agency I was willing to work with them. I would be happy to receive materials on a rolling basis. I, um, you know, I provided my telephone number so that they could get in touch with me. And they've just generally been ignoring me and they didn't give me any records and I haven't been able to contact them. Then when you get to that appeal stage or to the court stage, you're going to have built up a case for yourself that's going to look a lot more favorable because you tried to do what you could. You tried to be upfront from the beginning and this agency was not helpful. 
if an agency wants to withhold part of a document, that's, you know, as long as they cite proper exemptions, that's within their rights. But just because part of a document is exempt, it doesn't mean that the entire document is exempt. And so you can ask for segregable information. They should be providing this to you anyway, but they cannot just say this whole page is, is redacted. And if that whole, that page has lots of information that is not subject to an exemption, is not going to cause any harm if released and isn't doing you any favors by being redacted either, um, then that's an inappropriate redaction and they should have to uh, provide you as much of the document as uh, they legally can. Um, private devices for public business are fair game. So even if you're a mayor or you know an agency official uh, used their cell phone for you know communications with a vendor or a lobbyist or something like that, um, those communications are supposed to be uh, subject to public records laws. Um, we all do have something like some privacy rights when it comes to FOIA and what will be released, um, but those rights uh, are generally recognized to be non-existent once we pass away. So, um, you know, if you're interested in the files of an activist who, um, you know, might have been surveilled, you know, once that person passes away, those records are going to be um, accessible or that person could sign a, basically a permission slip saying that that those materials could be released. Um, there's generally a 25 year limit on classification of records with historical value. And I would note that you should be prepared to file a couple of different requests, right? Sometimes your first request is just going to be for um, something simple. So uh, probably a uh, you know, maybe like a user manual. And then once you have that user manual, you might look at it and say, okay, I know that this agency exports this type of information in this format. When they do that, um, I would like that export. Um, and then in your next request, you can reference that part of the, the user manual and the format in which you would actually like those materials released. Um, the agency is probably going to, you know, agencies are going to redact things, they're going to withhold records. Um, but again, remember that agencies need to cite reasons for redacting records. They often misuse exemptions um, and you can always appeal. And, and some people would suggest that you do always appeal, even when you get records that seem responsive. A lot of times, particularly on the federal level, agencies are just kind of trying to like check off that they responded to the FOIA request. And so they might not provide to you all of the records that you wanted. They might only respond to, you know, provide you some of them. In those cases, you can appeal and you're almost always going to get additional materials. Um, you can also go to the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS. They kind of act as an ombudsman between requesters and federal agencies. And even though they don't have real enforcement power, their review of a particular case can be persuasive when you bring that to court. Um, and also, it can be generally helpful for them to know that certain agencies are being particularly difficult because they can start to identify trends um, in the FOIA process and, and offer suggestions um, more directly than any individual requester. Um, and, you know, you can also always take uh, these things to court. Um, before you do that, I would suggest, right, going through negotiating with the agency, revising and refining your request as appropriate, trying to speak with that records officer and figuring out, okay, did I, did I, this request makes sense? Am I entitled to records in response to this request? You probably are, but you know, go through those steps. Um, and then if you can file an administrative appeal or consult uh, with OGIS, and then finally consider litigation um, on a lot of states and on the federal level agencies or, or attorneys can be awarded fees if agencies are found to have um, improperly withheld materials. So there um, are some attorneys out there who are willing to take cases on pro bono because they could get those attorneys fees later. I quickly want to just go over some um, uh, just brief specifics about some of the laws, because I had seen that some of you in attendance are coming from a few different states. Um, so if 
uh, I'm just going to hit on California, New York, and Texas really quickly. Um, but again, please consult that RCFP Open Government Guide. Um, it has a lot of good information specific to each of the states. California. Um, California has a time frame of about 10 days in which they are supposed to, you know, acknowledge your request and at least um, determine whether or not they're going to be able to release that record. And a lot of, in a lot of cases, in a lot of states, that is basically what the time frame means. It's a time frame in which the agency is supposed to acknowledge your request and um, determine sort of what it's going to take for them to fulfill that request. Um, under the California Public Records Act, there isn't an administrative appeal option, but some um, localities like San Francisco have local sunshine ordinances that people can use to combat um, agencies that aren't being responsive. Um, when uh, the plaintiff prevails in, in California, um, costs and reasonable attorney's fees should be made mandatory. Um, and then there are lots of good laws in California related to the transparency of different police technologies, including body worn cameras and automated license plate readers and military equipment. And so those are gonna be um, helpful for you if you're interested in those subject areas because you can actually very specifically point to those laws. Um, and, and finally uh, to note in California, agencies are supposed to under the law assist you in identifying and refining your request. In New York, um, there's a five day time frame for agencies to provide records, deny your request, or provide an estimate for when they're actually going to be provided. Um, there's a limit on duplication fees. Um, so uh, that's 25 cents a copy generally. So if, if an agency comes back at you and says that they're going to charge you 50 cents a page or something, that's um, against the law. Um, one can appeal to um, the agency's governing body. So that could be if I were looking at a police department, I might appeal to the chief of police or I might appeal to the mayor of the city. Um, that may or may not work out um, for a requester. Um, so after that, people can file an Article 78 proceeding. Um, attorney's fees are discretionary um, and, and it doesn't really feel like they're uh, awarded all that often um, unless agencies um, were definitely acting in bad faith. Um, other things to note, um, it doesn't really matter whether records originated outside of the agency in New York. If a New York agency has those records, they are um, considered possibly subject to FOIL. Um, all agencies are supposed to be able to provide a um, reasonably current uh, subject matter listing. So that is useful to know. Um, some states have said that if you request information from a database that would require somebody to search that database and then provide the information, that that is the creation of a separate record. In New York, that is not the case. Um, and in New York, kind of like in California, there are provisions in the law that say that an agency is supposed to work with you and they can't just reject a request for being voluminous or because an agency, because they think it's going to take up too um, many uh, people hours to actually fulfill. Um, and then in Texas, the time frame is also 10 days. Um, uh, there isn't a standard appeal process. So generally the appeal process is you get your request back, uh, you have some redactions, and then you send a letter to the appeal agency saying, hey, I don't believe that this was properly redacted. Here are my reasons why. I would like you to tell the agency to provide me my records appropriately. Um, in Texas, that process uh, doesn't really exist. And instead, what the agency is supposed to do is if they identify elements of the record that they want to withhold, they're supposed to um, at that point, reach out to the attorney general of the state and say, we want to withhold these particular records. This is our justification for it. Um, this can be a bit annoying and add some time to the process. Um, it can also work in a requester's favor because if they miss their um, 10 days to get in touch with the attorney general or the attorney general doesn't review that request in an appropriate amount of time, 
or if the attorney general reaches out to a third party whose records might be included in these responsive materials to say, hey, do you do you want us to not withhold these? Is that, you know, people are asking for these. Um, if any of those entities misses their time, their deadline, uh, they sort of uh, waive their non-disclosure rights. Um, also important to note in Texas is that some uh, legislative records and some records of government supported non-governmental bodies like certain nonprofits that are heavily supported by government funds are subject to disclosure. Um, and if a request is going to result in fewer than 50 pages, um, agencies can't really charge for labor. And then very, very quickly, um, just, a, just a couple of examples of times that records requests were used and hopefully they will this will get you guys thinking um so you know requests for text messages and emails and and information like that can really provide a lot of insight into how policymakers are behaving so um in san francisco uh mayor breed um has sort of said that they aren't conducting has said in the past that homeless sweeps aren't being conducted. Somebody um, requested text messages between the mayor and the chief of police. And um, those text messages showed that the mayor on multiple occasions had pointed to sort of encampment type areas and said, hey, can essentially like, hey, can you guys clean this up? Um, so, uh, definitely complicating the narrative the mayor was trying to provide there. Um, also, uh, you know, in, in other areas, emails can sort of provide insight into um, what lobbyists are talking to, which policymakers, who sort of the big developers are, and, and a lot of information like that. Um, so one might be interested in like sort of specific materials um, or specific communications. And sometimes people don't actually know what is being, um, what might be available. Um, and so one might conduct what a bit more of a fishing expedition. Um, so here's an example from a recent EFF investigation where up here in the top left um, is a news article from the Wall Street Journal talking about how federal agencies use cell phone location data in immigration enforcement. Um, we sort of knew that this was something that federal law enforcement agencies were doing, but we weren't sure if it was something that local law enforcement agencies were doing. So uh, we drafted up requests um, that sort of tried to hit this uh, balance between being specific and being vague. We included, um, you know, so we are, we sort of said that we are interested in records, um, records describing the relationship between your agency, whatever the police agency was, and third party providers of geolocation data. And then we listed sort of specific companies that might be involved, um, which we know about through other news reports. Um, and we said very specifically, right, if we if they have relationships with those companies, we want contracts, we want presentations and marketing materials and, and that sort of thing. So we included sort of a whole laundry list of potential potentially responsive records. We included specific companies, but we also said, um, that we were interested more generally in any of these types of records that they might have with any of these types of companies, um, because we don't actually we didn't actually know which of these companies they might actually contract with. Um, Terrence, just noting that we're at about time for questions, and yeah. whenever you're ready, and I consolidated the questions we have so far, um, Beryl, they're in your message box. Okay, sounds good. I'll just get through this one last thing. Okay. Um, so we knew that this type of technology was in use somewhere. Um, we weren't sure where. We wrote a records request that was kind of vague, but kind of specific. Um, we got a bunch of random materials back, a lot of it not relevant, but up here on this top right, you can see um, a marketing sheet that we did get from Fog, um, from a company called Fog, which we had never heard of before. Um, we saw that. Um, it was uh, analyzing location signals from 250 million mobile devices in the US. 
okay, this sounds like the kind of company that we thought might exist. We didn't know it existed. Um, now we're going to dig more into that. And then we submitted a whole new round of public records requests, very specifically looking at this company, which then became um, a news story. So, you know, there are different ways to, to get at your request and to get at the answers to your questions. Um, but we're in a lot of cases pretty sure that FOIA is going to be able to help. So with that, um, I will stop my share and we can address some of these questions. Okay. Um, Terrence, should I be looking at the ones that came in through messages? Yeah. Um, I sent them to you directly. I consolidated Perfect. them and gave them to you directly. Perfect. No, no, that's super helpful. Okay. okay. So Lauren asks, have you ever had a recalcitrant, recalcitrant government agency state that a FOIA would cost hundreds of dollars in fees to put together? Yes. Yes. Agencies <laughs> will try to do this. <laughs> and, um, so um, sort of two things, right? Sometimes an agency is doing this, and this is going to be a reasonable estimate based on a poorly worded FOIA request. So you might have said, I want all emails that mention marketing. And you might, one might have not have put a time frame on it. You might not have said um, any specific email address that you wanted. And so maybe now this records officer, say this records officer is at FTC or, or DOJ or something, right? Now this person is thinking, well, now I have to search the emails of all for all time for you know, thousands of employees, this is going to cost us thousands of dollars and hundreds of years. Um, however, uh, lots of times there are ways to sort of narrow it down. And sometimes agencies are just trying to be jerks. Um, so uh, yes, I don't know, Lauren, if you have sort of more specifics or you have a specific example. Um, agencies will do this. Um, don't let it deter you as long as you sort of like respond to them, it's not like they can close out your request. Um, but I would say this is part of why um, I think it's important to say upfront in the initial request, what, um, how much you're willing to spend on a FOIA request, because you will see sometimes very irritatingly, um, particularly with some local agencies that don't like to respond to requests, that agencies will sometimes know in their head that this is going to cost, uh, you know, even something like, you know, $500, $600, that's a lot of money. Um, and then they'll give you the records or they'll say, we have your records. Now you owe us $500. Well, you weren't expecting that. And now this agency is going to tell you, well, you don't pay your bills. So we're not going to respond to any of your future requests. Um, so this does, unfortunately, <laughs> in general, there are way you know you should be able to negotiate or refine your request to try to sort of like leapfrog your way past past fee issues okay i'm gonna go on to the next question and dave feel free to jump in or okay um okay harvey i had sent a foia request to dhs for records relating to its denial of fee waivers for various immigration services they have turned down the request three times now, claiming not to have understood the first request as grounds for its first denial, but offering a different rationale for each denial. The last response says it could not retrieve the records electronically and that we can contact the ombudsman. Manual retrieval would require reviewing only 2,000 to 3,000 records. Is the ombudsman option worth the effort or should I plan to go to court? Um, I think you should, I mean, you should, you should contact OGIS. I think it doesn't hurt to contact OGIS and they're very nice people. Um, and they care a lot about FOIA and they don't really have any, I mean, a lot of, you know, some of them might have, um, you know, sympathies. I'm sure they have some sympathy th towards the federal government, but um, a lot of them do genuinely like believe in the FOIA process for the people. So um, I would contact OGIS. Um, I would have to take a look specifically at how DHS is, um, denying you but i think um you know as long as you feel confident that your initial request was worded appropriately um you should be able to appeal i mean at the very least the appeal is going to you know yeah you should be able to at the very least appeal and um there's a good chance that again because this is related to the denial of fee waivers it might be that the 
the appeal authority is going to say, actually, I took a look at how they record and catalog, uh, catalog denial of fee waivers. And actually they don't keep track at all. And even though it's stupid, it's, it is going to take them a long time to deal with this, but they have to deal with this. Um, so the appeal process can do that for you or the appeal process could, you know, result in um, them just straight up, you know, saying like this agency was there, they're, it's made up, whatever it is that they said, and uh, they should be able to get those uh, records to you. And we are going to remand this to the agency for proper processing. So I think in the administrative appeal is going to be sort of your best next step. Um, Nia asks, is the FHFA included in this list as a conservator of the GSEs? Uh, so can Sarah, I am not entirely, can, can somebody give me the, uh, the acronyms there? This is, is this housing related, I guess, included in this list. I don't, um, let me see actually, yeah. let me just double check. Yeah. Oh, I see. Is this the federal housing finance agency? No, FHA. Yeah. Yes, that would be considered a federal agency. Is that the question? Yes, that was okay. the question. Okay. Perfect, yeah, then yes. Um, Brendan wants to know, are text messages discussing public business and emails from private servers discussing public records subject to a FOIA disclosure? Yeah, yeah, I mean, if they're talking about your public records request, uh, that's a public record. Um, and, you know, if you are, you know, something that we will suggest to people sometimes is, submitting a request for all of the records related to their processing of your request, that can come in handy, particularly when you get to the appeal stage, because you can use that to determine that, or to make the case that an agency didn't actually go through all of the appropriate steps to do the research for your FOIA request. Um, so if you say, um, say you have FOIA request number one, two, three, you send in a request saying, hey, I want all of the processing notes for FOIA request one, two, three, they send you back a piece of paper that says like, we checked our email, nothing came of it. Um, you might be able to use that in the appeal to say, they didn't check all of the other places I told them to check. Um, they, didn't, they didn't conduct an appropriate search and they should have to do it again. Um, but yes, if, if government actors are discussing public business, whether that be related to public records or to anything else, and those text messages are on a private server or on a private phone, they are supposed to be subject to FOIA. Again, there are like practical considerations, right? Like, uh, like possibly they deleted them or, you know, maybe they're not gonna let on that they um, have those communications, um, but technically illegal. Um, Lindsay asks, when requests are rejected for being unduly burdensome, do you have tips for how to respond when they aren't actually that burdensome or are burdensome but can't be narrowed? So it depends. If you're on the federal, I mean, it depends on like what it is that you're, you're looking at. I mean, sometimes they're burdensome, right? Because it is just the agency's own fault. Like, you know, I requested um, disciplinary records, no, complaints for from... Um, inmates uh, from incarcerated people. And the agency told me it was gonna cost thousands and thousands of dollars because they keep each of those complaints in each of the individual files. And so they would have to go through each individual file and get those materials. Um, in that case, it is going to be burdensome. That's not really my problem because they keep their records in a stupid way. Um, but in that case, right, what I can do is say, okay, can you just show me complaints from like the last five people who filed complaints or the first 10 people who, um, uh, you know, first 10 people on your list or uh, the last 10 complaints that actually went anywhere. Um, so you might look for a sample of what you're looking for. Um, or, you know, sometimes if it's like a database or something, you might go that, you might go that user manual route or you might ask to talk to somebody just in the IT department about exactly, you know, get on the phone and say like, okay, I would like to understand exactly how you're keeping these records because I'm not trying to be a total jerk to you, but also I need these records and I 
just simply don't understand how your system works and why this is going to be such an issue. Um, Lindsay, if you want to drop any more details, we can speak to it more specifically, but based on that, I think those are some of the suggestions I have. Just a time check, we have about five more minutes and maybe we want to save the last minute to 30 seconds with the follow up. If there's any follow up material we want to send folks. Thanks. Sounds good. Okay, I'll talk quickly. Um, anonymously, it has been asked. Is there a general response time from agencies? Um, a lot of agencies, right? There's that 20 day time frame. Um, some agencies, particularly smaller agencies um, that don't get a lot of requests, um, could respond much more quickly. A lot of the bigger agencies are going to spend um, many months getting back to you. Sometimes Muckrock has different agency pages. So if you look, um, say you're looking for FBI, if you go FBI Muckrock, it'll pull up a, an agency page and that has some basic data about how long it takes each agency to respond on average to a Muckrock request. Um, but uh, yeah, it really varies from agency to agency. Um, somebody else says, I haven't filed because of a concern for cost. Don't let that hold you back. I mean, you know, even if agencies can charge you, um, sometimes they don't charge you. Sometimes those records, you know, check that FOIA log, see if they've already provided those materials. If they've already provided those materials, somebody else has already paid for the time to redact them and to copy them, they cannot charge you that money. So keep that in mind. If you see a see something that has already been processed, just ask for those records, start from there. Um, how do you get records from legislatures, especially for internal discussions concerning passage of legislation? Oh, hmm, hmm. I don't know, Dave, if you have any suggestions on this, but in a lot of cases, you don't. <laughs> no, so you're, you know, there are various state legislatures have passed their own laws regarding their records, but it's mostly related to like spending and personnel you know, hiring issues or things like that. Like, it's not really anything that's going to be deliberative like that. Your best bet is going to be seeing what agencies they're talking to. So if they're, let's say it's the California legislature and they're going to, they're discussing a bill to do some sort of prison reform, um, chances are they had to talk to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation and the Attorney General's office. And so you would be able to go to CDCR or the California Department of Justice and ask for communications with legislatures and get it from that end. And that's something that we've done in the past. So when uh, you know we were trying to get a bill passed to improve um, the laws regulating license plate readers, the, you know, the legislature claimed the attorney general's office was claiming it would cost like $500,000 to do it. And so we, you know, sent it a public records for us for C for to the attorney general to try to figure out where they got that calculation, what they actually told the legislature. And so we were able to get it that way. Thank you, Dave. Um, Ash asks, is retribution by government agencies due to FOIA requests legal? No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anonymously, it is asked, is there any remedy for when they destroy records after your request for those records was submitted? That's illegal. That's very illegal. Um, does it matter if the discretion was according to a retention schedule or not? If an agency destroys records that are potentially responsive to your records request after you've made your records request, uh, that is super illegal. I don't know if you can do much more but sue them, <laughs> but they were really, really not supposed to do that. Um, it does matter if the destruction was according to a retention. Well, it doesn't really matter. If, if it was in response to your request, that's a huge issue. Um, Dave, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, it's just it's just scubby. I'll yeah, just leave scubby. it at that. Um, is there a cost for filing an appeal? No. Um, and then any tips for getting fast responses in time to respond to topics in the news? At the federal level, the expedited processing standards seem a hard fit for general information gathering by an advocacy organization wishing to challenge better understand a prevailing narrative. Um, you know, look for those smaller agencies, see how much you can narrow your requests, get friendly if you know that there are agencies that you are going to be contacting a lot because, you know, you can sort of build up those relationships with records officers just like you would with any other sources. Um, on the federal level, you're right. No, there are some places, there are some agencies where expedited processing, those requests that are approved for expedited processing take longer than the regular requests. So if you are um, interested in sort of those details, 
um, each agency is supposed to put out an annual FOIA officer's report, and it has basic information about how like those different tracks break down in terms of time. Um, so just take a look at that. But in general, I would say if you really need something quickly, um, you know, maybe do your regular sort of outreach to public relations. Um, you can ask for an expedited expedited processing on the federal level, but it's really hit or miss. Um, so um, I wish I had a better answer for you, but you know, sometimes you just have to sort of uh, maneuver the uh, connections you already have. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize that, yeah. that sometimes if it's fast, if it's something you need a fast turnaround, talking to the public information officer and getting them to produce the records, in a friendly fashion because they feel like releasing them is better for their media position, then you might get that a lot faster than the FOIA process. Hey, uh, we're at time. Why don't we take the final question and then transition into any follow-up? Um, and uh, thank you in advance. For this awesome. Yeah, I think, is this the final question? Oh, uh, I still have one on here about um, strategizing around um, uh, public records, backlash to public records laws um, related to policing. I think there are a few different people um, working on, on that, but it's hard to anticipate that kind of backlash. Um, so uh, feel free to reach out to us separately. We can talk about, about that. Dave and I talk a lot about public records and policing. Um, and at what point do you consider a FOIA admin appeal exhausted in order to trigger FOIA litigation to force disclosures? They'll respond to you. They, they also have a time frame in which they're supposed to get you some sort of determination. Um, and if they are dragging their feet on a determination, um, that's something else to bring up to OGIS. But in general, people will get you your appeal determinations much more quickly than the initial FOIA request response. Um, they'll send you a letter saying, this is our opinion. Um, Sometimes agencies don't care that much about the opinion or they'll like continue to be wishy-washy and giving you your response. Um, but it's, it's at that point that you should consider it exhausted. And then, you know, even if you get a favorable uh, determination as part of your appeal, you can still sue. You can sue at any time. Great, this has been wonderful. Um, I think we're at time. Um, Beryl and Dave, can you tell us, um, it, can folks reach out to you directly? If so, how do they reach you? And then I think you have some uh, material for folks. Do you want us at the center to send that out to folks? Um, uh, uh, what's the best way to, to get that material to folks? Or will you drop it in the chat? We can do both. Um, I think Dave and I can put our contact information in the chat. And then I can also share um, a link uh to the sheet and um you know uh and then if you also want to share it um, separately, yeah. mm -hmm. um so yeah let me just put it and dave you have any concluding thoughts no i mean we're always here as a resource and uh you know so feel free to reach out and we're interested to hear how things go for you great Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll send a brief survey to everyone as well, just to get your thoughts. Um, again, we want to thank um, Barrow, Dave at Electronic Frontier Foundation for this excellent training, and also Nasheard, um, who introduced us uh, at the center to Barrow and Dave. So thank you, Nash. Thank you uh, again, Barrow, Dave. This has been a wonderful training and opportunity for folks in our network. Um, thank you. Thank you. Jason, anything? No, nothing on my end. Just to, again, uh, thank you. The, the, the training was incredible, incredibly thorough in a very short period of time. You guys covered so much ground. Really appreciate you. And also your willingness to be available for folks who, who might want to follow up. So thank you again. Thank you all. Th thank you all the participants as well. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye, everybody.